that propels them through the water like darting battleships. Two long rows of teeth line a cavernous and ravenous mouth. Yet many wonder why such a successful predator would harass humans. A terrifying theory may turn noodling a wells into a suicide mission. Experts believe there's only one motive behind a well's attack. The fish are defending their eggs, and a noodler's entire strategy is to reach into the nest. With friends, family, and his noodling mentor father, Lee examines his well's adversary up close. Yeah. Oh yeah, 205 pounds, woo, nice, look at that. Hell, they're exactly like ours. Except that bottom fin. That bottom fin, He's though. got the same back fin, same side fins. Whiskers yeah, the, are on top, bottom lip sticks out. That back fin, though, when it comes out of the belly, goes all the way to the tail like an eel. Oh, I see. So he's 10 times more powerful in the thrust. <laughs> I worry about it because he's the type, he don't know when to let go. <laughs> I'm afraid he, he'd lie on me to take her. The weekend of the trip arrives. The team is confident they're ready for the toughest noodling challenge ever. Would you go wrestle one? Determined to take on Would a true river behemoth, well? driven by the quest of a noodling world record. I mean, I'm gonna feel like I just won the uh, Olympic gold. You know, the biggest fish and somebody doing something nobody else has done. Yeah. See you when I get back. Well, good luck. We're gonna need it. Yeah, what you want on your tombstone? Why not be a frontier? Call me Lewis and Clark. I'll be Lewis, he'll be Clark. <laughs> and Josh will be Sacagawea. <laughs> Spain, here we come. Thousands of miles from their home turf in Oklahoma, Looks like a catfish right here instead of a dragon. Then it's got the eel-like tail. It's a Welsh catfish. Yeah. There you go. I'm teeth on that. <laughs> you don't see that every day. Not in Oklahoma. Try practicing noodling that. See what happens. <laughs> he got a little more teeth and bigger teeth than catfish. Spain's Ebro River, 250 kilometers outside Barcelona. Accustomed to noodling waters they know by sight and feel, Lee McFarlane and his fellow noodlers face unknown terrain. Nearly run out of petrol driving up here. To find their ultimate target, the team needs help uncovering the Wells Catfish's favorite hideouts. We're gonna have a little look now at some of the areas that we're gonna go to by boat. Experienced fishing guide Stephen Buss takes the men out for reconnaissance some of the, the natural areas for the where they spawn so and, and they'll be around that area pretty much all of the year when we're doing it when we're getting wet i suppose once you've tried it you know you get your experience that's where you get your bravery from but i don't know it's mad i mean i, I just can't wait to see it really the team arrives at a known well spawning spot yeah, shame. It's Look time for one. their first ever noodling challenge on foreign soil. Think there's any catfish in this water? We're gonna find out. Immediately, Lee's veteran instincts kick in. That's what I was looking at. That right there is like, that's what we noodle in Oklahoma, that stuff right there. You know, we can, you can noodle to your heart's content along this little bit of margin as well. For this sport, Spain's spawning season offers a noodler's perfect storm. Rocky terrain, biting fish, and deep hidden lairs. From spring to summer, beneath these muddy waters, adult catfish fiercely defend new clutches of fertilized eggs, battling and chomping down on anything that comes near them. The noodler's mission? Find a nest big enough to hold a giant Wells catfish, reach in, and get bitten. Against Europe's largest catfish, the men know risks are high See, and precautions are vital. I want one to tie from uh, me to these guys. 
and then I'm wanting one to use for the fish. Uh huh. And this way, if the fish gets a hold of me, at least these two guys can pull me back. Right there on the side. It's kind of mushy. Is it mushy in there? I'm looking for these tubes coming out of this. For the first time in this extreme American sport, a hunt for a European monster is on. Let's go try that pump down there. This mush helps you sink in at six inches. It ain't rocks up that way. Yeah, but not big enough. You know, it's almost like um, like a joke sport to us. We sort of can't believe that anglers would go underwater and sort of secure their catch with their bare hands. On foot and in boats, the unfamiliar terrain requires constant surveillance. The men wade through the water, scour the landscape, and travel the length of the river in search of spawning wells. That right there is what we're looking for, something like that. Out in the water. We'll Take block three of you to block that. If we can find that right out here, we'll be in the ballpark See, then. Rocks Smaller quick. catfish find layers more easily than mammoth wells. In search of these river whoppers, the team looks for the mother of all hiding holes. I don't know. We just gotta keep looking. How many miles of river have you checked? Frustrated, after hours searching with no luck, the team gives up, but only for now. We just gotta go look somewhere else. Back on dry land, the noodlers head to the next location, cuidado, cuidado. hoping locals can offer catch and life-saving advice. They don't bite too bad. Language barrier, I'm lost. I'm just like, what? What's that mean? <laughs> Sí. Por favor. <laughs> Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. You want to go catch one? That's why I need an interpreter, because I don't understand it. ¿Pescas si duros con la mano? No. Why? No. ¿Por qué no? Porque es de locos esto, hombre. If I had a little more time, I'd love to learn the language, you know, so I can at least know whether they're cussing me out or telling me I was nuts. No hay nadie que pesque sirus con la mano. Es de locos esto. I think he's trying to tell me I'm crazy. He thinks we've done lost our mind, huh? The loco. Beneath a bridge several kilometers downriver, the men spot a promising rock formation. See, that looks good if they're hollow. That'd work real good, those tubes. They zero in for a closer look. I can feel the groove right there. Okay, go around and see if there's one over because this is like a tunnel going through here. We found uh, a nice little ledge, um, a big sort of plate of concrete maybe, a good sort of cavity underneath. God, that feels like you'd ought to hold one. Am I hitting you? Not yet. I'm sure if there's any fish down there, then these guys are going to bump into them. I did catch me a Spaniard cross hat. Thousands of kilometers from home, the hand fishermen bring with them over half a century of combined expertise. Oh, fish, fish. No, rock or something. It's a rock. But is the elusive Wells catfish too great an adversary, even for a noodling dream team? I came this far to catch the great big fish. I'm not giving up yet. We gotta do something. Keep looking. Getting disgusted, but I'm gotta keep going. Back across the Atlantic, it's an extreme barehanded fishing challenge to help save a species. A group of young scientists dare to grab, wrestle, and tag two of the world's most dangerous ocean predators by hand. Bimini Island, Bahamas. Over 80 kilometers off the east coast of Florida, this tiny, isolated atoll is one of the world's most fertile breeding grounds for sharks. For nearly two decades, 
Dr. Samuel Gruber has run Bimini's famous Shark Lab. Shark Lab attracts a courageous young staff ready to risk their lives to help keep threatened predators hunting the deep. Four people in each room. The Bimini Biological Field Station is built around the volunteers and the staff who are young scientific shark fanatics. Two formidable apex predators who call the waters of Shark Lab home, the nurse shark and the lemon shark. I had about a lemon shark as big as, I'd say about a seven footer, take my hand in its mouth and, and decide whether he wanted to do anything with it. Record setting lemons have stretched nearly four meters, weighing over 180 kilograms. Though they can survive in captivity, where other alpha shark species like the great white die, Lemons are far from tame. Armed with a mouthful of triangular, cutting teeth, even a juvenile can inflict nasty wounds. Handling these toothy specimens requires careful practice and training. Here we go, whoa! Doc Gruber keeps a stable of young sharks in a pen to teach his scientific protégés the do's and deadly don'ts of shark grabbing. Okay, yep, I got one. Uh, this is a little baby lemon shark. This is a male. You can tell by these little extensions by his fin. And he, this little guy is not happy. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put him to sleep right now. I'm going to put him to sleep. All right, come on, guy. All right. Now to put him to sleep, I simply turn him over. And it takes a couple of seconds, and he goes to sleep. Okay, there, that's cool. He's asleep. Two fingers. Today, Shark Lab plans to tackle their most dangerous but critical species-saving missions. Tagging two separate predators with radio tracking devices. Data on shark populations and migration patterns help scientists protect these apex predators in an ecosystem under siege. One mission requires a free dive in shark-infested waters. The other, a one-on-one -on -one wrestling match of man versus monster predator. Okay, gang, what we have to do now today, we've got to get at least one lemon shark. We need to put a transmitter on it. We don't want to get anybody bitten, and it's got to be scientist to shark zero. The team heads into the bay in search of a full-grown natural assassin. It's a lemon shark chase down. The method is bold and dangerous. To insert a radio tracking tag, the team plans to taunt and corral a lemon shark, ultimately grabbing it with their bare hands. You guys haven't seen anything yet, huh? <laughs> but don't try this at home. You got him over there, he's on the port. To your port, to your port. Suddenly, something large and gray passes left. underneath. Oh, he's coming towards us, on the left, on the left. It's a huge lemon shark. Straight off the bow! We'll chase it until it basically gets sick of being chased, and it turns around and will bite us. Most fishermen would leave the dangerous beast alone. But for the Shark Lab team, they've got their target in sight. The chase has begun. Sean's on the, on the bow of the boat, you know, completely unbalanced. And if we ever hit the bottom or anything, he goes flying off right onto the shark's back. What he's trying to do is not net the shark, but actually hit it so it turns around and bites the net. He's on it, he's on it, he's on it, he's on it. Where is it? The first attempt is lost. The team keeps up the chase. Okay, okay. Tell me if I should jump, say jump, and I'll get out. You better watch this, he might bite me. Come on, hit him, hit him hard. Then, success. Keep hitting him. Is he biting? He's on it, he's on it, he's on it. The shark bites down hard. Come on, Doc Gruber approaches the thrashing fish. 
The maneuver is extremely risky. He's wrangling an alpha predator face to face. Up close, the team uses the net poles to corral the nearly two meter long shark. In front, in front of his head. And Doc quickly grabs the tail. When a shark is tired, oh, it's too close. Its behavior is dangerously unpredictable. If you don't watch yourself, uh, you can get killed. The, these these things could could grab you in the in the thigh and you'd bleed to death in 30 seconds. So we can see the shark. Doc in. Ruber's got to move fast. They're fine when you leave them alone. If you mess with them, they hold a grudge. They will sit there very quietly, and while you're not looking, boom! They'll jump right up there and they'll bite you. He quickly yes. works to put the shark into a catatonic state called tonic immobility, which some believe exploits a shark's defensive reflex to play dead. This allows scientists to measure, tag, and even perform life-saving surgery. The other paddle, get the other paddle. Doc Gruber wants to insert a radio tracking tag, but the shark needs time to recover and rest. A buoyancy balloon keeps her afloat while the team waits to insert the tag. My concern about this shark is that we've got to let him go on this rope and swim around so he gets his breath back. What we do with these sharks may, may look uh, heartless and mean, but really, you have to annoy a few of these sharks to, to maybe save all of them. Everybody let everything go. Set him on. But Wake after monitoring up. the shark for several minutes, Doc Gruber makes a critical decision to forego tagging. The summer heat has weakened the shark too much to continue. The water is very hot now, and these sharks are overheated and they're stressed. While the team helps the shark recover, they use the time to quickly gather valuable data. Basically, we'll go down to them, we'll cut a little piece of fin off for DNA, and we'll take a measurement. We'll keep a crew here hanging around till they swim off. This one's already tried to swim off. The divers swim with the exhausted animal to help move water through its gills. When he tries to turn to shore, try to keep him going straight offshore. Though the team's tagging mission has taken an unexpected turn, they've gathered priceless conservation data. And for the Shark Lab, the day's work isn't over yet. Shark Lab team members Sean and Jim have another task. Find a nurse shark and bring it to the surface, bare-handed. Nurse sharks, pound for pound, are probably one of the strongest sharks out there. So bear hugging a nine foot nurse shark might not be the smartest idea, but some of the smaller ones I could get away with it. Old as dinosaurs, nurse sharks are true prehistoric predators, able to grow just over four meters long, weighing more than 130 kilograms. Two dangling feelers called nasal barbels enable these notorious hunters to stalk their prey before slurping it down. The nurse shark's giant throat cavity sucks in victims like a vacuum, raking meals across hundreds of flesh-shredding, serrated teeth. Sean and Jim are anchored off a large coral reef, a popular nurse shark hiding place. Scanning the bottom, Jim spots their target. John, there's one over here. Sean free dives six meters to survey the scene. He sees it. The notoriously tough predator is just under a meter long and wedged under the reef. This capture will be no easy task. After one last gulp of air, Sean approaches cautiously, 
armed with only a lasso. The diver strains to hold his breath and reaches from an awkward angle. The second he makes contact, the situation can turn dangerous fast. As predicted, the shark reacts violently. The thrashing predator snaps out at the rope, the divers, anything in reach. The two men grapple with the agitated predator, keeping just enough distance to avoid the vacuum suction of its mouth. It's thrashing around, it's trying to get away from you, so you grab it in one spot and the shark just turns around and your hand slips off and it's coming at you, so you're pushing it away with the other hand. Gathering his courage, Jim makes a bold move, grabbing hold of the bucking beast by the fins. He's got it in hand, but getting it out of water is the diver's next challenge. Jim clings to the writhing shark, risking his safety every second he's got the beast in his arms. At last, Sean and Jim have the nurse shark on board. He almost got me a couple times. To avoid harming the animal, they know the tagging has to happen fast. Yet any carelessness could cost them a limb. The two divers quickly implant a tracking tag and prepare the beast for a safe release. Okay, here we go. With practice speed, the men get the tagged nurse shark back in the water. All right, off you go, and away it goes. Perfectly fine. Two shark wrangles pulled off barehanded. Today, the lab is two missions closer to protecting and preserving some of the ocean's most amazing alpha predators. Spain's Ebro River. The Oki noodling team is deep into their mission, far from Oklahoma, on their hunt for a whopper record-setting Wells catfish. In uh, Oklahoma, this would have fish under it. It's wide open, it goes way back up underneath there, tapers off, it's got a cavity. Right in there, you trap your fish. This would be a perfect spawning spot for, you know, our flat is. We've had a bit of a rise and fall in river level. A storm's brought some rather unexpected weather and some water into the system. But two full days of a frustrating search. Go look again. Is straining the team's patience and confidence. They ain't where we normally would catch them. They gotta be somewhere. You gotta try something different. Change it up. Change strategies? Yep. Reeds is about the last thing we haven't done. After 48 hours with no luck, the men decide on their next terrain target. Dense reeds flanking the river's small islands. The wells often use tall grass as a nest a noodler's target. The team's plan is to approach the unsuspecting fish and grapple it straight out of the reeds. Check out that dark, dark one. That's a big one. Two of them right over there in the shallows. See the dark yeah, shadows yeah, I moving? Yeah, I see it, I see it moving up. One going That's down too. We might have a chance in this. Stealth is key for a surprise attack. But Mark McFarland is aware of the dangers of a blind strategy. I started getting just a little, maybe scared, I guess more respect for the fish that I haven't seen yet. Having to crawl back in the reeds on all fours to get to their fish, you know, I'm thinking, wow, this is almost like a monster or something. At any moment, the men could bump into Europe's biggest, most notorious catfish. Danger. Yeah, you never know. It's a big river. It's, there's some big fish in there. Very brave. You know, them brave men, true men, yeah. But the massive wells has evaded the team once again. Yet they press on. Abandoning the reeds, 
for the more familiar terrain of rocks and shoreline. Nice looking rocks. Let's try it. See if there's a hole. Oh, ow, ow, ow. Just get there. Just look around and see if you can I find got a hole. hole. Got a hole? Got, got a hole? Got, got, got. And suddenly, something latches on to Mark's hand. You got him good? Yeah. Need help? It just depends on what he does when I get him out. With no idea what he's got, he grapples the fish. Help. Experience tells him to move fast and strong, but the fish is fighting back, growing heavier by the second. Ow! I got all yeah. tail, all <laughs> tail, right here. <laughs> Head down here. Mark That's tightens his grip. Yeah. You got him good? I got him now. I got bottom lip. <laughs> we'll bring him out. Marshals his strength. It's all you. And gives a strong pull. <laughs> At last, together, they've got him. I got Easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small oh, Wells catfish. Mark estimates it weighs just under nine kilograms. First known catfish abroad. Now if we can just get a bigger one. It's not the whopper he's hunting, but it's the team's first noodle battling a feared catfish opponent on foreign soil. It's this experience finding the first hole, finding the first fish. It is pretty cool. Oh, now that's a just a baby. These little ones I'm used to. I want something bigger than what I'm used to in my own waters. That's what I came over here for. Huge fish, that's what I'm after. Let's turn him loose and let him grow up. Lee releases the small wells. In addition to his quest for a monster specimen, Lee's committed to sustainable noodling, saving catfish for future generations. Touch the fish in the water. The team soon faces their last day in Spain. Over 8,000 kilometers from home, only time will tell whether they'll have the ultimate showdown of man versus fabled man-eater, a giant wells catfish. on a remote island on the other side of the world. Barehanded fishing is more than a sport. It's a way of life. The deadly domain of an ancient clan fighting for their survival. Lembata, Indonesia. This tiny South Pacific island is home to one of the oldest traditional fishing communities on Earth, the Lamalera. We cannot grow food here or raise much livestock. Only the ocean provides what we need to survive. Our lives revolve around it. For centuries, the Lamalera have depended on one creature more than any other for their survival, the sperm whale. Though today this diet staple may seem controversial, the clan subsists in harmony with all creatures of the ocean, never taking more from the seas than they need, using every part of every whale they catch. Our ancestors were brought to this island on the backs of whales. 